Hey everybody, welcome to this week's episode of Whiskey Neat, spirited conversations with interesting people. I am your host, Christopher Hart. Now, am I drinking what looks like a cocktail? Yes. Is it a cocktail? No, because a cocktail, this is actually an energy drink, a cocktail requires booze plus other things. So we should add some booze to it. Uh, a little Waterford, a little dabble, do you? So we've been off for the last month. And by off, I mean off from this show, but not off. And I think what we're going to do, and Brandon had a great, great freaking idea, is that um, every year we're going to take January and February off to work on everything else we're working on, to focus on the show. But we actually have a great, a great couple of episodes coming up. So I developed a mortal enemy, a mortal enemy, with a man named... Um, well, backing up a second, uh, Sam Hewen became my best friend. And then I found out Sam Hewen had another best friend. And long story short, I now hate Josh Horowitz. So what I did, um, and I say that purely out of jest and jealousy, uh, I invited Josh to do the show today. And you know what he did? He accepted. Josh is, by golly, the nicest GD man I've ever met in my entire life. I can't even cuss talking about him. He's so wholesome. Uh, Josh joins me today on the show. We we talk about Sam Hewen. We talk about Happy, Sad, Confused. We talk about Josh's career. Josh has a, a, a career spanning two decades interviewing, by God, some incredible names, absolute legends in, in this industry. And he really, truly is a really, really nice guy. So we have a few drinks. We talk about his life. And I got to tell you, I go into it wanting to hate the guy because Sam Hewen's his best friend. But actually, uh, he, how can you not love Josh Horowitz? He's so nice. So today I sat down with Josh Horowitz. We talked through um, his life, his career, his people have interviewed, and, and the, the difficulty interviewing. There's actually a lot of bad stuff that happens behind the camera. Uh, even with this show, I'm sure it happens on a much larger scale with his show. You know, guests that are not fully informed or guests that are not fully committed. So, and how you have to deal with that. So, we actually had a great conversation. So, uh, my hat's off to the guy. He couldn't be, uh, I couldn't be a bigger fan. So, uh, but let, let's pay the bills and then we'll get to the interview real quick. So, um, I've talked about this a million times. Our, our chief sponsor, our, our official sponsor, our, my favorite sponsor uh, is Waterford Irish Single Malt Whiskey. Uh, so if you're familiar with the concept of terroir and wine, you'll appreciate Mark Rainier's Waterford Single Malt Whiskey from Ireland. Mark is combining his Scotch whiskey and fine wine talents to produce an authentic series of Irish single malt whiskeys based on traditional wine industry principles. I mean, the, this we've talked about this whiskey a bunch. 100 proof Irish single malt, single grain, single farm, single origin. Everything about this is is pure, unadulterated, natural spirit directly from nature straight to your glass. I mean, it's so awesome. So uh, we got to drink a little bit of water for today. It's in my energy drink now. And talk to Josh Horwitz. It was awesome. So let's get to it. Without further ado, please welcome my guest, uh, the host of Happy, Sad, Confused. Uh, there's actually a few things he's about to be hosting coming up. Uh, a big fan and my new best friend, Sam, you're out, Josh Horowitz. Cheers. All right, Josh, buddy, thanks. Thanks for doing this. Thanks for having me, man. It's good to see you. I, I am. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not going to say starstruck, but I'm a little nervous. Uh, I'll, 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 I'll tell you why. So I've, I've always been slightly jealous of you, right? Like just, I, I had no intention of doing the show other than just having a few drinks with a few people. The tagline is spirited conversations with interesting people. And I, I, uh, a few years ago, I think it's been a couple of years now, uh, we got uh, a little well-known, somewhat well-known actor named Sam Hewen to, to do the show. And uh, I discovered in research of him that uh, he has a best friend uh, <laughs> that has his own show oh, Lord. and uh, is now my mortal enemy. So no, we are. <laughs> we're part of the fan club. We're co-presidents uh, of the fan club of Sam Hewen. It's uh, 
it's good to, yeah, I mean, we were talking before, we've never officially met, but we have met along the, the transom of the Sam Hewen universe. universe. The um, multiverse, yeah. Yeah, exactly. But no, there's, <laughs> there's room for plenty of Sam Hewen friends in the media, and we're just two of them. Well, it, it, it was, uh, for me, you know, of course, I watched the show, my, me and my wife together, you know, we end our night with a great episode of, of, of Outlander. But what really kind of won me over with him is it's he is genuinely a, a whiskey fan, a, a huge whiskey nerd. So to me, the first time I got to meet him, at, I think at Wizard Con a couple of years ago. I was like, oh, this guy like actually likes whiskey. It's not just a, a thing, right? It's not just a, a, a business or a revenue stream. It's like, dude, I love a good drink. And so I fell, of course, in man love with Sam Hewen. And, uh, and then, yeah, I, I found you. And I think we even had a little clip where uh, I threw a little shot at you uh, that, that kind of circled. And uh, Sam's like, uh, Josh who? Josh who? <laughs> uh, but uh, dude, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to meet you. I, I have so much I want to talk to you about. And uh, I figured we would do it over drinks. I love it. This was an easy invite to say yes to for a variety of reasons and the drinks only help even if it's 11 a.m here in new york i'm gonna i'm gonna summon up the courage to to drink with you my friend it's uh it's 10 a.m here so uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah but you're a pro you, you this is what you do yeah yeah it's uh I, I think i've talked about this before but many years ago i, I used to work uh shift work in aviation uh, mm -hmm. private jets and charters and that sort of thing and uh, you, you'll work all night, get off at 7 a.m., and then you don't want waffles. You want, like, steak and a beer. Right. And, and it'll permanently ruin your concept, this, this construct of appropriate times to drink. And, uh, and now you can have a 10 a.m. whiskey and not really think about it. I mean, I, I will say that story started very chillingly when you were talking about working in aviation and about to start talking about drinking. And I was I was I was about to report you because I can't think of a worse combination. <laughs> <laughs> OK, that's a fair point. Uh, but I, I'm, it was, I off, it was a, off duty. It was off. I got it. I got it. We're I good. wasn't we're a good. pilot. We're good. And I wasn't. Uh, yeah, it was definitely off duty, but I wasn't a pilot. I didn't actually handle planes. Uh, it was all the logistics side, the backside, you know, if Fair someone enough. wants to go from point A to point B, uh, we handled all that stuff. So what should um, I be starting with? Should I be starting with this particular guide me? What do I do? Yeah. What, what do you, remind me what we sent you? So I think the one you just opened is the, I have that one that's Waterford. Is oh that's... yeah. So this is an Irish whiskey. This is a great, uh, hundred proof, all organic. There's a big push for terroir. Uh, but it's just light enough that I think in the mornings might be a great palate warmer. Okay. 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 I'm, oh, I mean, it's a little complicated. If you yeah, if you grab the bottle by the neck, okay, and then put your thumb like this, yeah, and then just push, it comes right off. Look at that! Got all the tricks. If uh, it, and if, I and I should fill it to the top of this glass, right? That's how it works. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think morning pours something a little light, lighter might yeah. be best. No, trust me, I I know my, my know my limits. So you you are. Uh, the guy that interviews, right? Like you are, uh, what's that comic book? Uh, who watches the watcher? Uh, <laughs> have you been interviewed? Uh, have you been on this side of the, the screen for questions? I certainly I have, it's not, um, I could probably, yeah, probably 20 times in my 20 year career. You know, it's not like I, 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 I generally speaking, um, I always say when people invite me to be a commentator or an interview subject, I'm like, I'm much better. At the other side, um, I can, I, you know, I, 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 that being said, look, I'm good at a, I'm good at a party. I, I'm good. At, I've got good stories. If you, you know, mention a celebrity to me, like I, you know, who's your favorite celebrity? Invariably, I might have <laughs> a funny story around it. Um, but uh, yeah, look, I mean, I'm, it's so ingrained in me to be to um, make the other person look good and funny and smart that. Um, it's counterintuitive intuitive of me sometimes to be like the, the focal point. Sure. But again, that's what the whiskey is going to help with. And that's what you're going to help with. <laughs> you're going to bring out the best in me. Yeah. It's funny. Uh, you mentioned something that I, I figured we'd get to later, but let's get to it now. Uh, 20 year career. You look incredible. You look, <laughs> I I'm 34. <laughs> I look like I've lived a very hard life compared to Josh Horowitz. I appreciate uh, that. Yeah. You're 40, 45, 
45. Yeah. Jesus. It's going to catch up. It's one of these things where I, I know like overnight at some point, it's just like the hair is going to go white and fall out. Like the gut's going to just explode. It's just going to be like that Dorian Gray painting is just going to catch on fire. Cool yeah, exactly. But yeah, look, I mean, I've worked for most of my career for quote unquote youth brands for MTV, the bulk of my career. So like by all intents and purposes, they should have like taken me out in the back and shot me like 12 years ago. So it's a miracle um, that I'm still where I'm at. And maybe my bountiful dark hair and youthful complexion has helped. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, man, I think, uh, you know, I don't know how old Sam is, but I think you, you, are you older than Sam? Yeah, I think he's, I want to say he's like 40, early 40s. Yeah, I think he's, I think so. yeah, I think he's 41 or 42. Yeah. No, he turned um, 40 last year. I know. Cause I asked him about turning 40. I think he's maybe 41 by now, but yeah. It's uh it's, it's been an incredible journey. And, uh, you know, I, I first, uh, uh, how often do you Google yourself? Do, do you do the Google trends where you kind of see what's, I wish I could say I'm above that kind of thing, but I've done it. Sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, no, don't, but don't feel bad. I mean, don't. it's, a, it's obviously, oh, it's only twice a day though. It's not a weird thing for me. Like, it's just, <laughs> I need to just see what people are saying at all times. Christopher, what? Why are you judging me now? Well, I, I gotta, was, I, was I gotta go. To I gotta some, go. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to do some digging. And uh, if you Google yourself, the oh. first picture that comes up is Sam Hewen. Like you, you're oh, permanent, right? you're permanently yeah, tied to him. That's amazing. Um, and then, uh, you know, so I was looking through your history. You have interviewed at, I mean, everyone, there is no, uh, one of the hardest parts that we have on this show is just the pitch to some people. Like I'm a big fan of Doug Jones, right? Doug Jones is this iconic actor who, yep most people wouldn't recognize unless it was in prosthetics, right? Like he's right. got these iconic roles. And the moment you mention ESPN, they're like, I don't, we don't like sports. I'm like, I don't, we don't talk about sports. Like th that's the last thing we do. I, I, right. we drink, we, it's a camaraderie thing. And then same thing with females. It's, it's hard to, to pitch to some uh, actresses, managers, like we're, it's just a conversation, like trying to yeah. get more. And that's the one criticism we get is like, you guys should have more females. I would love to have a, a you know who I would love? I would do anything in this world to have a drink with Kathy Bates. Oh, that would like be how, gold. how incredible would that gold. be? Gold. I think she's and, evaded me too for, for what it's worth. She'd be awesome. <laughs> She'd be fantastic. Is, um, is there a, a white whale? Someone that, because you've had this incredible repertoire, not just interviews, like yeah. skits. You know, you, you've done uh, things with Benedict Cumberbatch and uh, right. just, uh, I mean, the list goes on and on. Is there someone that you've always wanted but can't get? Yeah, there, there, there are dozens. Um, the ones I go to um, off the top of my head, there's some filmmakers. Like, so, I mean, look, you know, if you follow my stuff, you know, kind of like there's a, a wide breadth of the kind of stuff I do, right? I, I do a lot of silly sketches for MTV and Comedy Central now. Uh, I do more serious kind of long form conversations for my podcast, um, which also includes a lot of filmmakers. I'm like a big old ginormous film geek, as you probably know by now. So like certainly there are people like, um, you, know, you know, go to my childhood, Spielberg, Lucas, like those those folks have eluded me. I, I probably talked to each of them like 10 words on a red carpet, but that's not a real conversation um, podcast. Like one of my white whales that I've been trying to get. I'm still he actually has a movie coming out soon as Nick Cage. I've talked to Nick Cage. I've done like some short form conversations with him, but I've never done like the deep dive conversation with Nick Cage. And I'm obsessed with him because he's not only an amazing actor, but like just from another planet <laughs> in the best possible way. Um, and I want to dig into all of that. Um, yeah, but the list gets smaller as I get older, as I age <laughs> into it. I mean, it's a good problem to have, but um, but I'm knocking them out. I'm knocking out most of them. Um, and, and it's becoming more and more like, okay, I've talked to that person for like six minutes, but I really want to do like the 45 minute, like deep dive conversation. Um, and then it's also just like catching up with the next wave, but like the ones that get me really excited are the ones like that I grew up with, right? Like the, the people in like the eighties and nineties that like I was watching their films. I was obsessed with um, Jim Carrey. Like I'd love to do on the podcast at Incredible. some point. Incredible um, conversation for sure. Yeah. And I've done stuff with him. I actually did a, a, a skit with him years ago, which as you can imagine is like, Oh my God, you're like doing a comedy sketch with Jim Carrey. Like that's out of this world, but um, he's such like a thoughtful 
interesting dude to say the least that uh i'd love to have that like kind of real substantive conversation with too but that's the beauty of this job it's like there's never going to be an end i'm going to die with like a thousand people i never talked to that i that i wish i could have talked to so like that's what keeps it interesting um the day i'm like you know there's no one left on the list is the day i should probably retire yeah i mean i mean i completely agree i think the uh the concept of, of having a genuine connection and a substantive conversation with, with, you know, a lot of, um, what do you, what do you call them when you do the press junket quick two minute, you know, yep. th- there's no substance or depth there. And a lot of times when some people try to slip in some, some really complicated or hard pressing questions, like there's been some famous clips of, um, uh, <clears throat> Uh, that guy that was interviewing Robert Downey Jr. and brings up the '90s and, and Robert leaves, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's it's a tough thing to pull off. But if you can have that moment and that connection and that and it comes from a good place, like there's there's I don't think anyone feels threatened by Josh Horowitz, right? Like there, there's clearly a very nice gentleman. Those like, fools, the, they think yeah, the intention, <laughs> yeah, the intentions, the, the intentions are, are are clearly good. Sure, of course. And I think I, 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 I appreciate that. And I think that's that's behooved me well over the years, like because I certainly did my time, especially in the early years when I was doing this kind of thing, um, doing these junkets, which I think by now everybody knows what that's like. As you said, they're like four minute interviews. You walk into a hotel room and it's like it's just so counter to anything like um, substantive or real. Um, but, you know, I was able to make that work and I was able to convey, I think, a. um a seriousness about like my love of what they do, right? Like that came through, even if I was having fun with them or being silly with them. Um, I think the actors and the filmmakers could sense that I knew what I was talking about and I loved what they did. And I was there, as you say, for a good purpose. I want every, I want them to look good I'm, without fawning over them, just being real with them and just like, you know, talking about the art in a fun way, hopefully. Um, and then you know, I kind of built on that after years of doing it, built on that trust. And then I was able to kind of launch these other cool things like launching what was initially called After Hours on MTV, which was my initial like sketch series um, and getting the buy in of celebrities to do crazy stuff with me for longer periods of time. And then later on, as the podcast wave hit, starting my own podcast about eight years ago. Um, and, th- and by then I'd had I'd done like, you know, six conversations with like every movie star and, and every publicist knew me. So like, I could say like, you know, do you want to sit down with me for 45 minutes? And they, they knew, as you say, they were in a safe space, even if it might go silly and go off the rails, it was for a good purpose. It wasn't a gotcha conversation. It was a, um, a loving chat that would hopefully make their client look, look good. So, okay. um, yeah. Yeah. Has, it, has there been, so like one of the things that we do is we always offer, um, not necessarily final cut or final approval, but we, I tell them, like, like I told you before we started recording, if there's anything we want to cut, just let me know. Right. Um, and when there's alcohol involved, uh, I, I have had a few, uh, like, uh, I, publicists reach out to me as soon as the interview was over and say, Hey, can you send me a copy of that first just to make sure it's all clean? Yeah. And of course we've got a great team, Brandon and Jack, they know what to cut. Clearly they know what to cut. Right. Um, but ha- has there been, uh, even knowing that you are such a, a nice guy and that the intentions are correct, has there been interviews that were completely scrapped and, and, and never shown the light of day? Um, I'm thinking, yeah, first of all, yes, absolutely. A thousand percent. Uh, you can't do like the volume I do without that happening occasionally. But the, the percentage is very, very minuscule. And I'd like to say, like, as I've gone further in my career, I know how to steer it in the right direction so that we, we avoid those minefields uh, without it being like a fawning, you know, just like empty um, conversation. But I'm trying to think of the ones that come to mind um, that are kind of fun. It, it happened in the early years more in, there were some sketches as I was like, the sketches were big swings. Like I'm not, I was not like trained or whatever as a comedy writer. I kind of learned it as I went. I loved comedy growing up among other things. I My favorite I, thing of all time. Agreed. I, I mean, I, and I, I grew up like even when I got out of school, I took some stand-up classes. And I did stand up for like a five second period. It wasn't for me, but I enjoyed it and loved it and admired it. So I, I don't know what it was, but the chutzpah of youth um, when I was at MTV, I, I started to do these sketches and I was like just collaborating with a friend at MTV. And we started to like write these kind of silly sketches and get people to do it. Now, 
um, early on, we got a few people to do sketches and two come to mind that were never aired that just didn't work. And, and they didn't work for a couple of reasons. Um, one is uh, Justin Bieber. <laughs> Justin Bieber about, I mean, this has got to be like 12 years ago. Um, it was one of those things <laughs> where like, and this is like height of like Bieber mania. This is like, he is ruling the world. Um, he was doing a thousand things. We were in LA. We were supposed to get like 45 minutes with him. It was like, he was teaching me how to like, it was like an infomercial of like how to be Justin Bieber, like kind of a, a thing. Um, and it was one of those things where he, he had not been prepped for it. He didn't know what he was walking into. He, they cut us down from like, I'm sure you've experienced this where like, oh, we, we, we say you have 45 minutes and then you have, you end up with like 20 minutes or whatever. So this is one of those cases where it was probably something like that. Like, oh yeah, you've got 45 minutes. And by the time he showed up like hours late, we ended up with like 10 minutes and like the sketch couldn't be done in 10 minutes. So what we ended up with was like a Frankenstein bit that was just not usable. I think we ended up using like little bits of it for like an outtakes reel years later, but um, he was also a kid back then. I'm sure he's great now and mature and whatever, but he, he just wasn't like in the headspace right. as like a teenager to like, you know, be accommodating or helpful. So that was, that was a, a shoot that didn't go well. The one that really hurts because this is an actor that I hold in such high esteem. And one actually you were asking about who I've like never done, um, never had him on the podcast. This is top of the list. Gary Oldman. Love Gary. Oh Oldman. my gosh. Talk Gary. about nostalgia from eighties, uh, nineties. Come on. And the greatest actors of all time. The professional Bram Stoker's Dracula. I mean, all of it. Tip-toes. I was obsessed with all of it. <laughs> <laughs> tiptoes. I love that. You know, tiptoes. <laughs> yeah. Oscar worthy performance. Right? Anybody that's listening or watching Google the tiptoes trailer. One of the greatest trailers ever. <laughs> um, oh my God. Anyway, he was promoting a film called Red Riding Hood, which you may not remember. Most people don't. It was from Catherine Hardwick, who had directed Twilight. Um, it was like a Red Riding Hood, like <laughs> horror take. Um, he, it was one of those cases where we had a sketch that was approved by the studio. They're like, great, do the sketch. We're in a hotel room. He walks in. He has no idea what he's walking into. Literally, I have like a pinata up and like all these weird props. And he's like, walks in. He's like, what are we, what are we doing here? Oh, and, no. I, and I have to like try to explain to Gary Oldman, like, oh, this is, here's the bit. Like, here's the script you've never seen. Can you go with it? Um, and like five minutes into the sketch, he just said to me, he's like, he just leans over to me. He goes, I just don't think my heart's in this. And I was like, Gary Oldman, I love you. We can stop. Let's just stop. It's all, everybody good. Take the pinata down. <laughs> Let's not inflict any more <laughs> injury to Gary Oldman. But that one always sticks. We've never aired any of that footage. Oh my gosh. Nothing I'm, heart- against Gary. I'm feeling the heartbreak. Oh, I, it took me years. I, I, I've i seen him a couple times in years later. I have no Does relationship with him. No, he has no memory of it. But I've apologized like numerous times. So like, just so you know, years ago. I had a pinata in front of you and you had no idea what you were walking into. I apologize. <laughs> yeah, it, it's uh, so you, you you speak to one of the largest issues I think that I've experienced because I'm I'm very new to this. We, we the show was, you know, I think was just meant to. I, I don't even have an answer for that. What, how it was born was like, like almost like hot ones where we have a few drinks and just kind of break the ice. And then we started getting comedians on and then some actors and celebrities on. And it was like, oh, okay, this is kind of evolving. And those conversations tend to be like, if you can break through that, that celebrity barrier, especially over drinks and, and they, and you all of a sudden see the human in them and, and it, the conversation can be go- like beautiful. It'd be a beautiful conversation. But what kills me, what I, what I've experienced is, you know, like we will pack up and fly a, a film crew and all these things to L- LA or some other place to film this thing. And then the, the actor or person has not been briefed at all what it is. Um, I, I mean, we did one with, and, and the interview went fine. And he was actually, we actually still broke through the ice without alcohol it was Ray Fisher from justice league. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. He, he sat down and there's all these bottles in front of us and he's like, I'm sorry, what's this? And I'm like, oh, I know. Yeah, so, it's, a, it's a, I, I, I a thousand percent relate. Yeah, it and, happens all the time. People don't realize that's, yeah. The, his team just didn't brief him. And, and that's the one thing that's like hard to, same thing with Alan Richson, a great interview. Uh, I think, I, I think it, what, what's great is it, you don't just rely on the alcohol to break the ice, right? Sure. Ray Fisher and I have a very similar upbringing. So we, when I found out about his mother and what he does for her, it was like a 
boom, we bonded like nothing. And then Alan Richardson, same thing. Uh, I sent him a whole case of alcohol. And then right before we start recording, he's like, I've been sober for years. I'm like, what? Oh, no. It doesn't say that online. So like, <laughs> oh, no. Why did your team say something? They sent me your address. But uh, you surrounded me with my triggers. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. So, but it, but it worked out. We had yeah. a, a great conversation. I thoroughly enjoyed the new Reacher show on, on Amazon. So it, it, it I'm a same thing. I, I love film, not to the, as much as I love film, I don't think I could say I love it to the same level as you. You like live in New York. You, you've lived and breathed it for 30, 40, you know, 40 years. That's true. Yeah. It's something that uh, I can appreciate. We can bond over, but it, it, it's heartbreaking when they walk in and they're like, what's this? I have, I have no idea what yeah. we're doing. So it makes you, it makes you stronger in a way. I mean, you have to adapt, you have to adapt to any situation. And um, yeah, cause often like depending on the gig I'm doing, sometimes I could be doing like a comedic interview. Sometimes I could be doing a serious interview and, you know, often I know within three minutes, like what's, what's the vibe and had like, I may have come in with a certain game plan, but I'm going to, I have to read the room and I have to read the, the talent. And if I don't know them already, like, okay, they're not going to go to 11 with this. I'm going to have to like get them there. So it's, it's, um, this is, this is a, a business where it's all about the interaction and reading who you're talking to and being in the moment. It's what, when people ask me about like, you know, the art of interviewing, for me, it's not, and I, I bet you can relate to this. It's it's less about the questions on the page. It really isn't. That's a factor, sure, of what you want to talk about. It's about being in the moment and looking somebody in the eyes and feeling their energy and just talking to them like a human being, which sounds really basic. But in my experience, 90% of the folks that do what we do don't talk to quote unquote talent like they're human, which is such right. a crazy thing to say, but like, listen, react be a, a human being even around like ginormous movie stars it's harder than it sounds but that's what you got to do yeah the uh <clears throat> vice versa the the sadness of not of them not being briefed is one thing but the thing you mentioned about them uh you know oh, you have them for 45 minutes and then they show up it's like you only have 10 that, that's happened one time to me and the victory the satisfaction of them starting that way you know being the very closed off and then having a conversation and and feeling that you're breaking through to them as a human, and then all of a sudden that ten minute thing, it ends up magically, being, yeah, yeah, yeah. It magically, it's 30, 40 minutes, and you're like, <laughs> all right, what a victory! That's great. So, That's the best. Yeah, yeah. Have you uh, have you experienced that at all? Have you has there been has there been someone that you've won over where you felt like they were a little disconnected, and then you punched through and got to them? Yeah, here's one. Um, and this is a, this is an actor that I consciously avoided because I knew like his reputation. I'd had some experiences with him. I knew he was just kind of like a, a prickly kind of, or just kind of a tough interview. Uh, Christoph Waltz, two-time mm. Oscar winner. Uh, and he is, he's a serious dude. Eh? He's like, and, and generally speaking, what I say to folks is like, I can talk to anybody if they have a sense of humor, particularly a sense of humor about themselves. Like, Germans I need, are not uh, tremendously known for their sense of humor. Yeah. He's, and he is like, and he doesn't, um, open himself to smiles and happiness. He seems like he's very just like, he's a, he, he's a formidable person to talk to. Um, and I had, and, and his folks actually pitched him to me for the podcast. And I was like, uh, I don't know. I mean, this is a long form conversation. It's 45 minutes. Like what if like in the first five minutes, I can't get him to really just, you know, talk. Open talk. Up. Yeah. Um, and I think that raised my game. Honestly, I kind of like did, I mean, I, I'm kind of a, a maniac when it comes to research and I always over prepare, but I, I, I don't know. I did a lot of research and I, and he opened up, he really did. And I actually found myself like relating to him and him relating to me and him smiling and laughing at times and, and me really enjoying him as a conversationalist. And that was, as you say, those are the ones you kind of really take pride in. Like anybody can talk to, you know, to name drop for a second. Like anybody can do an interview with Dwayne Johnson, Hugh Jackman, um, you know, like these notorious, like good guys that are just like, you know, the very charismatic charm, like out the wazoo, like they, they just, they ooze it. Um, but it is the ones that are pricklier, that don't suffer fools, that demand excellence and, and engagement um, that I take pride in. And he's one that like, I, mean, I consciously avoided him, but he ended up being a great guest. And I, I'm, I'm, I take a lot of pride in that one. Yeah, he, he reminds me of uh, Daniel Day-Lewis with an accent, right? Like there's, there's a level of, of uh, stone, yes. like such a serious heaviness to him that the idea of, of 
and I didn't know that you interviewed him. I'm going to go back and see if I can find that interview. Yeah. But the idea of a, such a serious person actually opening up is is definitely a win. It's a huge win. You know, I will say again, this is all about name dropping because it's what I do, sadly. But like, I, I interviewed Daniel Day Lewis many years ago, not for the podcast, but I did him for that movie uh, Nine. He did like many years ago, and and contrary to what you would think, super charming, like sweet, soft spoken, like not Christoph. I mean, I totally get what you're saying because like the way he commits the roles and the kind of roles he takes, but Are like heavy, yeah. Uh, yeah, but he was he was the best. I would have killed for like a real conversation with him. He clearly doesn't never like to do press. And now that he's retired, I, I think that ship has sailed. But um, but that was one that was surprising in a great way. The 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 win that I take is what happens after the interview. Right. Do they hang around for a minute? Mm-hmm. Right. Like uh, we, you know, I, I, Blake Anderson and Adam Devine did the interview uh i'm gonna repeat the i'm gonna in kind name drop although I mean, it's not daniel day lewis or no no kathy bates but um they showed up uh and i don't think they quite understood what the interview was as well but they're this these fun you know charismatic guys once the camera's on and and then they hung around for like two hours after the interview amazing and just drank and talked and i was like oh this is this is it. like worth everything like the, worth yeah. the trip to la worth everything to the part that doesn't end up on camera and uh, same thing with cameron monahan i'm such a cameron monahan oh, fan cool. and uh dude hung out on my balcony smoking cigarettes for three hours i was like i don't even smoke cigarettes <laughs> but, but i'll, I'll smoke <laughs> for a cigarette you. with cameron monahan yeah <laughs> of course of course that's awesome yeah no i've done some stuff with the, those workaholics guys they're great they're the best and yeah when it's like there's no differentiation between um on camera and off and you're like oh wait we're we're just have you know you're not gonna be my best friend for life but we can just like be real people and that's that's really great and that's part of like again the joy of sticking around as long as i have is like just a long level of familiarity with these folks where they trust me and like there's there's less difference between on camera and off and it's um it's it's a really nice thing we're like at this point you know i'm not hanging out with these folks in my downtime but like i do have you know like kind of real levels of familiarity and semi friendship with some of these folks that, you know, I used to put on a pedestal. Yeah. Well, and I think that the most you can, not even the most you can hope for, but the, the best case scenario is yes, you do have a, a genuine conversation uh, even if they don't stick around immediately after, but it's like a moment of like, like one of the greatest things I'll get is an email from their publicist after said, that was great. Perfect. Uh, he loved it, but whatever, whether yeah. or not that's true, it, it feels good. Uh, and then the, you know, <laughs> we're not gonna be best friends, but if I get a follow on Twitter, I'm like, Hey, oh, like, what an interesting percent. experience, you know? Of course. I always like, yeah, I've definitely had those moments over the years. Like, I mean, and yeah, like I remember like, again, it's always the, 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 the people that I, I followed when I was a kid. It's like when like Cameron Crow started following me on Twitter, I was like, what, <laughs> why does Cameron Crow care about me? Why did, how does he know who I am? Like Tim Burton. I started, I did Tim Burton. I've done him a bunch of times. Tim Burton knows who I am. That's crazy to me. Like I skipped, I skipped school to see Batman when I was 13 years old. Like, I, like so it, that's, that stuff is just, will never be, uh, not be mind blowing to me. It's, it's it, correct. It's never old. Uh, the, one of the things I wanted to understand a little bit, so I know you've had this, this 20 year history, um, interviewing and, and being involved in MTV and and of course, comedy central, uh, is this, was this the, the goal? Was this what you wanted? Uh, what was your long-term goal? What's, what's 19 year old Josh Horowitz, uh, planning for his life? Um, so when I was in college, I definitely like, I always a pop culture nerd. I grew up in New York city, loved, loved movies, TV, New York Yankees. That was like, those are my things, right? That was first dream probably was be like the Yankees, like play by play announcer. Um, didn't, uh, stick with that. But when I got to college, I did fall in love with radio that what, what we're, you know, what we're doing right now, radio was my first love and the college newspaper, um, started my own college talk show, uh, in, in school, um, and kind of learned in anonymity, how to book people, interview people, uh, failed while nobody was watching. Um, and I knew I wanted to, by the time I got out of school, I knew I wanted to be in work in the media. I didn't know where or what or how I didn't. I think I secretly maybe wished and hoped I would be like a radio show host or in my you know dreams, a like on camera person. But it, it really wasn't something I actually entertained as like a, a, a real realistic option. 
Um, out of school, I started, you know, I did some like media internships and I, I wasn't sure, like, do I go work for a radio station? Do I work for a talk show? It was kind of what I was open to anything. Cause I just don't needed a job. And, uh, like, you know, I'm sure anybody can relate. Uh, I ended up my first gig out of school was as a producer and I was a lofty or maybe a s- associate producer, uh, a lofty title for someone my age, but I, it was a talk show hosted by Charlie Rose. For those who don't know, Charlie Rose was a PBS uh, talk show host who had a great show, long form conversations with every manner of celebrity, politicians, actors, uh, you know, athletes. Uh, sadly, Charlie turned out to be a pretty crappy guy who was taken down by the Me Too movement. Um, but the show remains, <laughs> at least the show, uh, you know, the history of the show remains. And it was a, a great, great learning experience for me. I worked there for four years and learned how to prep and interview uh, hosts um, with like all the relevant, relevant information and, and book guests and suggest questions and really in a comprehensive way. This, these weren't short interviews. These were ironically what I ended up doing myself later on. Um, and then, yeah, like the short version is I kind of bounced around. I didn't know like, again, what my ultimate path would be. Um, worked for a couple different talk shows, worked at a magazine, was a reporter for Us Weekly, uh, wrote a book of interviews with filmmakers. Um, and then I kind of stumbled into a gig at MTV as a, as an, um, my, my job title was the coordinating editor of MTV Movies Digital. It was not on camera role. I was not meant to be the host or anything. But um, they took a shot on me. They had seen, to date myself, I had a blog back in the day where I was talking about pop culture in a fun and obsessive way. And they're like, oh, this guy loves and knows movies. Let's take a shot on him. My on-air career didn't start really until I was after 30, which is very unusual kind of in this, in this youth-obsessed media world. Um, and it really just organically grew. You talked about like kind of how your show evolved, like, and kind of like, oh, let's just kind of try this and see what it becomes. You know, that's my, my greatest successes have been things that I didn't plan out that I just kind of tried. Um, I started to do interviews for MTV. They started to use me on camera. And then I was like, oh, would you guys be up if I try to do a sketch with John C. Riley? And they're like, sure. First sketch was with John C. Riley was amazing. And it's all, all the fun, cool stuff has blossomed from just like trying crap out and seeing if it works. Some of it hasn't worked. Some of it has. And, um, and yeah, so it, it, to a long winded answer to your, to your short question is there was no plan. There still is no plan. I've kind of just um, gone where the opportunity has been and never ceased to be curious about trying new forms out, whether it's a podcast or a sketch show or doing going to be doing a new show for Paramount plus soon. So it's like, you know, it's, 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 it's different ways to skin a cat, different kinds of interviews, different formats, but um, it keeps it interesting to keep trying new stuff. Have you, you mentioned Paramount plus, are you, are you able to talk about what in some way, what it's supposed to be? Yeah, I, I, I probably not, but I'll tell you. I mean, who cares? I mean, they have. I, I don't think it's like <laughs> shrouded in secrecy. It, uh, I, I'm doing what I guess what I can say. I won't say like the name of it, or I don't even know when it launches. But I'm going to be doing a uh, series where I'm going to be talking to Paramount Plus talent, like prominent, like Paramount Plus talent about their lives and careers. It's it's more of a straightforward, uh, uh, comprehensive conversation show. Um, but you know, all the, all the streaming services are kind of like looking inward now to right. kind of prop up their own, um, great, uh, talent and, um, Par- Paramount plus is that, uh, it's Yellowstone and mm-hmm. yeah, yep. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, yep. 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 I'd be interested to, uh, that means there's a very, I mean, we're now connected. What is it? Six degrees of seven. <laughs> Kevin Bacon. Uh, I, so Ryan Bingham was just in town and okay. he's got great ties to Houston and he's, and we talked a little bit about uh, what's coming down the Taylor Sheridan pipeline in terms of, of things. So there's a very real chance that you'll be sitting with Ryan Bingham soon. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I don't, we haven't, nothing's been, Hmm. What can I say? <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. Nothing's been signed on the dotted line yet, but I'm, I, uh, I'll just put it this way. I work, uh, I own a few spirits brands, whiskey products. Uh, I, he wants some advice on some things in that realm. So uh, ho- hopefully I'll be helping uh, nice. Ryan bring to life a cool project soon. But 
Um, I like how this started with me revealing too much and ended with you in a conundrum. Like, oh my god, what have I done? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So, so don't worry, no one's gonna see this. Uh, the, the, there's, uh, yeah, I didn't realize. Uh, yeah, so nothing's been finalized yet, but uh, there's a few projects. So, in in, in the history of, um, as a separate note, definitely not referring to what I just said, but on a separate, completely separate note. Uh, the the realm of celebrity spirits products is is often not regarded well because one they don't care about whiskey the way that say Sam Hewen does right or two um, it's just done wrong like there's there's some th- some things that are clearly wrong so I, one of the things uh, I'm a big stand up comic fan one of the things that I want to do is there's a couple of New York comedians that I'm trying to bring to life a whiskey uh, we've talked about it on the show I can talk about it now. Uh, Mark Norman and Sam Morell want a whiskey for their podcast. Great New York stand-up comics. I, I, I know what they need to do for it to be well-received. Uh, I would like to help, you know, my way of changing the spirits world would be to make those things done in a more respectful way. Sure. You not know just I mean? throwing like, your like, name on something and not having any knowledge of the. Yes. Like yeah. I, I've talked to Sam uh, and, and, and his partner, Alex. Have you ever talked to Alex? Yeah. Yeah. He's yeah. great. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's so likable. Uh, every conversation I've ever had with Alex has been tremendous. But um, I have a funny Alex story when you're when you're done. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I've talked to Sam about like you know what do you want to do, and this is what I think. Uh, it, unsolicited advice. This is, this is what I would also do. I think would be really well received from Sam. Uh, and and they're obviously they're crushing it right now, so they, they don't need my help. But I things may develop i, I poked him in the first interview that you should do more than whiskey and he's done also done the tequila so i just tried I, it it's very tasty it's good i i think they're definitely heading in the right direction but what's your alex story oh so i i just uh i just went to london for the outlander premiere uh which was awesome and I watched I, it it was awesome <laughs> it was fun and uh then i went to they had a fun party there um i'd never met alex in person i'm talking to some folks and a gentleman comes up behind me uh, grabs me by the shoulders and he just goes, I, I, I don't know what his accent is, to be honest, uh, maybe you do, but he said, <laughs> this guy says to me, I just wanted to come over and, and meet the man who has the most kissable face in this party. And I, and I'm with like my wife and a friend and I'm like, what is going on? <laughs> who is this dude? <laughs> what is happening? And then he's like, it's Alex. And I'm like, Oh, Hey, (laughs) so yes, he's a great dude. We finally connected in person and, um, yeah, I feel like I'm on the payroll for Sass and X spirits by now. I should be getting a cut, but, uh, it's it's good stuff there. There's been a couple of times where our schedules almost, uh, lined up to be down in Mexico at the same time. And I, I would, I mean, of course I've had a drink with Sam. Uh, I, I would, I would love to have a drink with Alex. Every phone call I've ever had with that man has lasted at least an hour. <laughs> like it, it. it's a long conversation about our kids, about our product. I mean, he's got a couple of daughters. Uh, he's, he couldn't be a more, uh, uh, easy to talk to guy. He's very yeah. nice. Yeah. Um, but yes, no. I, I think the direction they're heading is, is exciting because there, you have no idea what's next, right? Like it's not just, uh, you know, flavored line extensions or something simple. <laughs> It's like, no, it could be anywhere, anywhere in the world. Uh, there could be a new, a completely new spirit that, that Sam dipped his toes in, which is great because it just speaks to his level of uh, nerdiness, right? Like you're just obsessed with it. No, I'm, I'm impressed with, with how he's built out. You know, it makes me gag a little bit to talk about someone's brand, but he, like he's doing it right. He really is like, you know, the Men in Kilts reality show, the Clanlands book, like these have all been hugely successful endeavors. And I think it's because they're not, taking it lightly there whether it's a spirit or a show or a book it's just it's it, it feels um handmade it feels like they're invested in it so um you know it's part of the reason why like i'm more than happy to be you know google searched with sam hugh <laughs> it's like he's a good dude it's yeah, yeah. stuff the right way um so yes uh well happy. it it yeah. it definitely makes it clear in my secret insecure rivalry of who's his best friend when you google josh horowitz and you see sam is the first photo next to it and uh oh yeah so when you google chris it's just a bunch of whiskey bottles hey Um, well you you've seen enough of my stuff with sam to know how much crap he gives me and how much he likes to tear me down so of course along with being his quote unquote uh best friend i he uh, you know he's destroying my ego one fragile day at a time 
one meeting at a time, one interview exactly. at a time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, to pivot a little bit. Um, so I, I know that you, you've got, what else did I send you? Oh yeah. Um, let's see. So I have here, um, prideful goat straight rye. Oh, there we go. That's mine. That's my baby. Congrats, dude. Yeah. And I've got, just so you know, I also have here, oh, two prideful goats. And then this is a Kentucky straight bourbon. Yeah. The 15 year we'll end with that one. Okay. So you want me to, do I couldn't remember next? if I sent you a cognac or not, but, um, Wait, so this is, this is gonna sound really basic and stupid. Can I ask this question? Sure. Should I have a different glass? Like, oh no, I, I, I'll tell you. Okay, it's a great question, and so there is a lot of um, pop and cir- pomp and circumstance when it comes to uh, oh, you should rinse it out and nose it before this, and a lot of that is is bullshit. Uh, these are all cast strength, foolproof whiskeys, what you're about to get into. Mm-hmm. So they're so overwhelmingly robust that anything that's in the glass is going to be immediately washed away. Okay. So, um, you know, w- going from 100 proof Irish whiskey to a, uh, I think it's 115 proof rye whiskey. Speaking of which, do you, what's your experience? I know I've seen you do shots with, with Sam. Do you, are you a drinker? What, what do you normally I'm a drinker, but I, I am so ignorant. I'm one of those, I, look, over quarantine, like I, I got my little like home cocktail bar going briefly and tried to kind of get a little more sophisticated. Hasn't really taken. I mean, I love a good mixed drink. Don't get me wrong. But I have no, my, my wife is is the wine aficionado. I'm the mixed drink guy, but I don't, I, I have no knowledge. This is why this is a little bit helpful. Even this is my ulterior motive to learn a little bit more and try a little bit more. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I uh, you know tequila, um, you know whiskey. I'm open to it all. Yeah, pretty pretty. Yeah, so that's a pretty yeah. So you're in a, uh, you you enjoy drinking in general, but so with with again, there, there's a lot of pomp and circumstance, a lot of over dramatic. You know, you have to do this, you have to do that. Right. It's very simple. Uh, I mean, we've all even within the beer world, right? Like they have different glasses for different types of beer, but we've all been to a baseball game and drank a fifteen dollar beer, which is really a two dollar beer out of a red cup, right? Like right, it's right. just. <laughs> So um, the one thing that can be a bit of a growing pain with this is it is cash strength. So what I tell people is to just take uh, smaller and smaller sips until and, and leave it in your mouth. The alcohol is going to adjust your it's going to soak into your tongue and your and your palate. It's going your mouth's basically setting the stage to be drinking neat whiskey. So take a little sip, leave it in the front of your mouth wait for the numbing to kick in then swallow if you swallow and it and it's rough to swallow you swallow too soon so leave it in your mouth let your mouth adjust and then what will happen is for the rest of the session of you sipping and drinking and whatever uh you'll take slightly larger slightly larger sips until you're full-blown drinking neat whiskey straight from the 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 barrel which is always kind of like the most sam elliott speaking of which have you talked to sam elliott i uh, he did the podcast a couple years back he he damn it he was amazing he started i mean talk about moments he started to like well up and cry talking about his dad talking about talking about making an emotional connection sam elliott crying in front of you in your office like what jesus christ um this is an incredible life no, no, this is, this is, this is very helpful tips. I'm excited. So I shouldn't be drinking this with a bendy straw is what, what you're telling me. You can <laughs> bendy straw is fine, but I would still, you know, what, what a lot of people do. And this is kind of our, our culture's fault is we, we live in a shot culture, right? So everything is immediately to the back of the throat. The trick is to, and I remember doing this. So when I decided that I was going to get into whiskey, you know, many moons ago, I bought a bottle and I sat on the couch. I, I distinctly remember exactly where I was. And I said, I'm going to sit here and I'm going to learn how to drink whiskey neat. Because everything we do is with, you know, cocktail or mixed or water or ice cube. It's all choking the spirit, which it's fine. If that's how you enjoy it, that's how you enjoy it. But um, <clears throat> it's it, the simplest way I tell people is take smaller and smaller sips until you adjust. Even if it's literally a couple of drops as you, you know, to bring to your lips. Uh, and you're 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 gonna eventually just learn, and you'll find yourself liking uh, drinking neat at, at cash strength without you know burning the hair off your face. I love it. Well, you look forward to my my bit where I was doing the exact wrong thing on the carpet of the Outlander premiere, where we, we were doing shots of Sassanac spirits. But that's, that's the last right. time. Now I'm going to be doing it the right way. Well, the Scots did did a lot right. I mean, they've they that whole Glencairn glass was. Um, 
it's become iconic, right? Like that, sure. that this shape, this, this tulip shape has been brought to us by Scotland and uh, you know, uh, there, there's nothing better to learn how to drink spirits neat um, than in a Glencairn glass. But um, I had another question I was going to ask. Oh, I remember. So we were pivoting. We tried the new whiskey, rye whiskey, cast strength. I want to. It's a little spicy. It's like a spicy on the tongue. Yes, it's a rye. Rye is known to have a little spicy bite to it. Uh, This is uh, a straight rye whiskey. It's about six years old. Uh, There's a lot of bubble gum in it, which is kind of neat. But yes, you get that little rye bite. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to let's talk about Andrew Garfield lying to your face. Oh, the bastard. Uh, (laughs) If he weren't so charming, I would hate him. (laughs) First of all, he is so charming. Him. Um. Oh, and I don't know why her uh, her name is uh, skipping me at the moment. That's okay. Uh, his, his his Mary Jane. Um, oh, they, uh, but, oh yeah, Emma. Emma's the best. Emma Stone. Emma Stone, Emma Stone is yes. uh, like when people ask me like who's like the most real. Like I've seen Emma like in the wild in like real life situations. Same person. Couldn't be nicer. Has done like again. I sound like a horrible ass like name dropper, but has been like nice things for me like outside of like the work stuff. Like she's like the best. Well, the best. Th- there's something that comes through specifically with Emma and, and Andrew that come across as genuine humans yeah. that of that are kind of notoriously known to kind of avoid social media and uh, and a lot of times interviews, right? Like uh, yeah. I know that uh, I don't think there's been a long form discussion with Emma. Am I wrong? Uh, no, Emma's, Emma, Emma, Emma's done the long form thing. She's on my podcast. Yeah, she has. I mean, less so I think in recent years, I, um, you know, there's that kind of thing where like you kind of have to do it when you're like in the awards train now, I think post when she won for La La Land and she's like now starting a family, she's definitely retreated from that for a bit. Cause she just frankly doesn't have to, you reach a certain level and you're like, I kind of did it. <laughs> like yeah. I'm, I've reached a certain stature and diminishing returns, but, but um, yeah, but this is not about her. It's about the fans. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> think about the fans. Emma. No, she's the best. There's, I have nothing bad this- to say about Emma. There's this great need, especially uh, in in the current environment with um, celebrity to to attract, uh, you know, when you are genuine and and, and human and kind and nice like uh, Andrew Garfield, um, Emma, Emma Stone. uh, What's the guy's name from uh, uh, Third Rock from the Sun? He's uh, you just interviewed. Oh, Joseph Gordon-Levitt. Yes. Like they're, they're, yeah. they're so yep. human and they're, you know, a lot of them are parents and have families in there. There's this, for me, there's this attraction to, I want to see them talk like humans for an hour. Yeah. Not, not the press chunk and interviews, not the, yep. you know, they don't have to necessarily do the, the podcast circuit, but to see, to see uh, these mega stars, mega stars, A-listers, right. Just, yep just be human for an hour is the most fascinating part of podcasts. Yeah. No, most, and most of the, I will say invariably most of the ones that people like perceive as that are that it's like, you know, everyone's like Paul Rudd's the nicest guy. Guess what? Paul Rudd is the nicest guy. He's the nicest <laughs> yeah, guy. Also like, doesn't age a day. Doesn't age a day. Totally the same often on camera. Like I have a total, I've had a man crush on Paul for 15 years. Like is the coolest dude. And will always, is just like the sweetest. And uh, Will Ferrell, like notoriously the nicest man on the planet. Like I, and is the same off camera. Like it makes me laugh off camera when I've seen him at things as much as on camera. Like it's, it's, it, you know, it's a real privilege to like, th- th- look at the end of the day, they're still human beings. <laughs> Let's not put them on a pedestal. They're not any more special than you or I, they're human beings, but they're real. And it's really cool to like, get to know really talented people that are nice on and off camera. So, yeah. Well, I know they're real because, he, he, you know, he lied to your face. He did so, lie to my face. What so uh, <laughs> I bought it. Did you buy it? What, what, what were you thinking? Do you think he was going to? Well, did you think so he was I mean, of course, the whole, world, the whole world was talking about leaks and, and, and speculating. And I'm curious. Uh, I'm, I know I, don't, I think I know the answer to if I were to ask this question. But I was going to ask before that interview, are there things that he says to avoid talking about? Or did, did anyone know you were going in to, to uh, question him about it? Because, uh, I mean, there's been a few, like, for instance, I interviewed, well, I don't want to say, but I interviewed someone within the Star Wars universe, and there was a recent controversy within the Star Wars universe. Mm-hmm. And before going into the interview, they were like, you know, don't ask her about this. Yep. 
And I said, okay, I'm happy to avoid those things. But uh, with the level of secrecy around Marvel and and that whole massive, you know, multi-billion dollar franchise. Yep. Uh, I'm curious if, you know, because I've seen you confront celebrities at times in the nicest way, of course, <laughs> but like to kind of like hold them to yeah. what people are talking about. Like, you know, it, you know, uh, there's a lot of speculation around this. And of course he lied in the best possible way. It's a fun, it's a fun game to play. Like, cause like, I'm not an idiot. I don't expect anyone to say to me like, yeah, I'm in it. Like who wants that? I don't want it to be ruined for me or anything, but like, it's part of the game. This goes back. Like it goes years ago. I had one that like also circulated early on. I remember talking to Marion Cotillard when she was in Dark Knight Rises and there were rumors that she was going to play Talia Al Ghul, who she ended up playing. And she just lied straight to my face. And like, again, I didn't expect her to say, yes, I'm playing the bad guy in the Dark Knight Rises, but like, it's fun to play the game. And like, then you like can play the clip and you can play the clip back later. And sure enough, we had a great exchange when it turned out she was uh, the bad guy in Dark Knight Rises. Similarly with Andrew, uh, to answer your question, nope, no stipulations. I've certainly been in that situation that you were like where people have been like, hey, can you avoid this? And sometimes I'll say, sure, no problem. Sometimes I'll be like, I got to at least ask something. It's up to them to like bat it, bat it away. Um, but uh, in that case, for whatever reason, he was at, he was promoting a movie nobody saw, by the way. Main, this was for mainstream. No one's seen mainstream. It was a tiny movie uh, early in the year. So look, a lot of this is luck too, like, Yes, it was it was very fortunate that like I had the access and he said yes to doing a long form conversation with me, um, because, again, keep in mind, like. Most people that are getting Andrew Garfield for for an interview are getting like five minutes with him if they're lucky and like you, you can't really like go in on Spider-Man if you're talking about another project in five minutes, you have like three questions. I had 45 minutes. So I like spend 25 minutes on his current project. I have the luxury of like talking about other stuff. Slipping it in after, yeah. Totally. Um, not to mention, I do have a, a long history with him. So like, I, you know, I've been talking to him for probably 10 years. So like there's some level of fami familiarity. Um, I know now he was, pr he was ready. Like he knew like I could potentially go there that I probably would, but knowing that I'm like a, sentient smart human being and a nerd so i'm sure he had it in his the back of his brain of how he was going to answer the question the thing i delight about that conversation is and i like to like point this out is i never asked him if he was in spider-man i made a point of not asking him i just literally if you watch the tape i say like i don't even know how to ask about these spider-man rumors and he just stops me right there and the gentleman doth press protest too much. He starts saying, dude, 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 I have to tell you, I, I, I don't know how this started. I'm not even in. He just goes on and on, on and on. And I'm like, I didn't ask you, dude. I was just saying Spider-Man. And he went off on this crazy rant. So very telling in retrospect. And um, and then, yeah, he was very kind to come afterwards and kind of have like his first on camera, like deep dive on all the lies and it was really fun to kind of like go through every rumor and how he obfuscated and how he avoided stuff um and yeah like that was that was one of those like perfect storm moments where like i was in the right place right time right actor right film doesn't happen like that often but that was that was a really cool one i mean everything lined up just right i, yeah. I watched the follow-up interview after i'd already seen the greatest spider-man movie of all time by the way come on uh yeah and you call him out on like you you know you son of a bitch and and then you go i i went back and found the original interview and of course went through a, a, a couple ones past that and i just uh, i thought man it was a, a perfect moment in time and, and i'm curious has there ever been a moment where you've asked someone or caught someone i mean like for instance the image there was an image of uh of Andrew that people were circulating of him in costume on set that people said was Photoshop, but there was it turned out to be completely real. <laughs> right, right. Has there ever been a time that you've caught someone and they're like, all right, listen, man, I'll tell you the truth, but you have to cut this out. Oh, I'm thinking I'm sure there have been, but now I'm on my second. I've had a couple whiskey. moments where yeah. Uh, yeah, I should have asked you on the third whiskey. Uh, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, I've Something. had a couple yeah, moments ahead. where I, I got an honest uh, reply about things coming down pipeline. And, and one, I mean, the Alan Richardson interview, he says it on camera that, uh, I mean, he, I, I mean, Brandon, correct me if I'm wrong. And he did make me delete it, but he, we're talking about his history in the DC animated universe. You know, who Alan Richardson is. Yeah, of course. Richard, yeah. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. So um, 
you know, he's played uh, in the DC realm quite a bit. And I asked him, have you ever thought about hopping over to the Marvel universe? And he's uh, he starts smiling fucking ear to ear. So happy. Uh, and says that he um, there's, there's something coming down the pipeline that he can't really talk about. Um, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe yes, maybe no. And I thought, um, I mean, that's the best I could have hoped for. Right. Like, right. and I fully expected that his, Oh who yeah. Was, who was on the call to say, Hey, Chris, can you cut this? Didn't ask me to cut it. So we left it in. Uh, and so I am eager to see how this plays out. Yeah. That's a great one. See, it's so funny. You never know how you like, you really never know. Like sometimes they'll, they'll stumble into something. I, uh, sometimes they're just, super tight-lipped a lot of stuff has happened to me like again this level of familiarity a lot of it's off camera they'll like show me after an interview they'll be like hey here's a screen test i did for this amazing role do you want to look at like a photo and i'm like oh my god why didn't you show this to me on camera? no i want to i want to tell everybody about this like i mean i've had that happen a lot um but i've certainly stumbled into a bunch of like especially early in my career i was more like scoop driven like when I was doing the junkets, like try to get the scoop, try to like get the uh, break the news. Like I remember, like again, way back when, like Aaron Eckhart, like at a random junket for some movie, like revealed he was playing Two Face, which was like what? Like I remember running back to like MTV, like with the tape. <laughs> I was like, like we have to run this. <laughs> he just like threw it out there, like oh by the way, I'm playing Two Face in Dark Knight. I'm like, and it wasn't out yet. It wasn't out yet. Well, wow. he, he, here's what he he had, he was cast as Harvey Dent in the movie. People assumed, oh, maybe he would also play Two Face, but he literally said, like, I'm playing Two Face in the movie, which, like, to comic geeks was like, what? Um, and I definitely like there was a period of my life, and it's still an aspect of me that like gets off on that. Like, oh, if you can break like a big movie geek news thing, like in the context of a conversation, like it's a it's just a rush. Matt Smith, I had on, you know, Doctor Who, uh, such a fan. And, so, so great. I'm like one of my favorite, like whether you, I, I'm not a, a crown person, but if you want to listen to a, a fun conversation on the podcast, I had him and Claire Foy on one of my all time favorites. Cause it's so random. It's not about the crown at all. It's just two like witty, cool British folks, like riffing with me for 45 minutes, highly recommended. But I, he did the podcast a couple months ago and he, um he had this like extended like conversation with me about like he was supposed to be in the last star Wars movie um, rise of Skywalker. Right. And he basically said like, it was a really cool role. He, he elaborated more than you would expect somebody to do to, Cause like they have all these NDAs, et cetera. And it became like a huge thing. And it was, it reminded me of back in the day, like when I was like chasing those kind of scoops, like, Oh yeah, I'm like kind of in the middle of a news cycle now. I'm in the middle of like, and it's, it's a, it's a cool rush to like be there for that. Um, but in being such a fan, I mean, Matt Smith was the doctor that brought, and I hate to say this in this way, because it implies that we weren't already together, but it brought my family together. Oh, I, I have, I have four, I have three daughters and a son and four kids. And, uh, we watched, I was our, I was a David Tennant. The David Tennant was my doctor. And, uh, I, when Matt Smith took over, I showed it to my, my wife and daughters and they became obsessed. So then every week during, but only during Matt Smith's time as the doctor, we watched it as a family Love it. and it was this, uh, I mean, plus, I mean, his time as a doctor was so emotional. Like it was so great. I mean, we talked about weeping angels for years. The girls were right. terrified every time they would see so, uh, an angel statue in someone's front yard or something, you know, but, uh, you should get Karen Matt's- Gillen on, by the way, Karen Gillen to like, oh, same. Lot. I bet she's a, I bet she's a whiskey drinker. I feel like she's gotta be. Oh, she yeah, would be gotta, great. Right. A couple yeah. drinks with Karen. Yeah. Uh, but yes, to see them make the transition from, I don't, I, I'm not saying that BBC is smaller, but to see them make the transition to like a list well-known yeah. in the zeitgeist within America, like K- Karen is, I mean, she's, she's there. She's amazing. Yeah. Uh, Matt, I was such a fan. I remember that rumor of him being in star Wars and then nothing came of it. Was it and nobody, just and no, no, but nobody had ever asked him. He never shot his stuff. It's like one of those things, like, again, they, they do so many interviews. It's hard to, like, get the like the scoop from anybody at this point because it's it's all happenstance. Who happens to get them first, whatever. For whatever reason, nobody had ever asked Matt Smith, like, what happened to those reports that, like, you were going to be in Star Wars? And, uh, again, I had the luxury of time and, and, and the right timing. And he, um, no, he never shot anything. Uh, he didn't really say who he was playing, but he like basically said like it was a really cool, juicy role. And because of everything around Rise of Skywalker, which obviously was a fraught, weird, like they 
were clearly rewriting as they were going. Um, it just made that sound bite that much more interesting. Um, I'm already looking forward to it. He's, he's in the new, um, what is it? Mobius? Morbius? I can never remember the name, the new Jared Leto. Uh, Mobius? Mobius, right? yeah. Mo- no, is yeah. it Morbius? No, no, I think it's Mobius is the Mobius strip. The- yes, that's the, yeah. that's, that's the cooler one. Morbius. But, uh, <laughs> Morbius. 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 Now I'm betraying. They're like, you're a poser, Josh. You should yeah. know it's Morbius um but matt uh i'm hoping to get matt on soon again because he's He's, so fun uh, he's in the the prequel to game of thrones right he is we talked about that too he's already shot it yeah 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 um so so let's talk about that process you you and and, and if you've got let me know how you're doing on time but i'm okay um, i'm okay for now yeah yeah all good i'm having fun what dictates your schedule in terms of do do you do you see what's what's coming out and you say okay uh, you know i want to morbius is about to come out so then you time it around the release obviously and then you reach out to people or do they a lot of them are reaching out to you what's the process it's a mix um it's a mix i'm I, i'm lucky enough that people pitch me especially for the podcast folks uh which is great like uh the luxury of choice is amazing um but i'm constantly like you know, i have like my calendar right here of like all upcoming movie and tv releases and it's like um, I love to work. Like I love this stuff and I, I'm like a workaholic and I have a show for comedy central. I do constant interviews for MTV. I have my podcast. I do something called game night with guests. I saw it. Um, I, have, I have this new paramount thing. So it's like, I have no less than five shows. I'm like constantly booking. <laughs> so it's like, I'm playing like, Sometimes I feel like I'm playing like six dimensional chess, like looking at the movie release calendar, like, okay, where do I put, like, what do I pitch Matt Smith for? What do I go for this? Like, I, like it's, it's a great problem to have. Like, I know I sound like I'm like, what an asshole, like, oh, he has to choose. But like, it's kind of like budgeting my time, but also figuring out like where somebody goes when. And also people always think like, oh, like nobody says no to you, Josh. Like, no, 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 guys. Let me, let me, let me, let me tell you, um, I get a thousand no's. I get mostly no's from people I ask. Yes. I get people pitched to me, but I'm chasing folks for comedy, for sketches, for the podcast, for everything. And, um, no matter what level you get to in the industry, you're going to get more no's than yeses. It's like the same thing you always hear about. Like, you know, there's always another, like, you know, after party that you can't get into another like velvet rope to get by it doesn't matter unless you're brad pitt unless you're leonardo dicaprio unless you're jimmy fallon like there's always going to be another room an- another echelon of guests so um i'm always hustling i'm always balancing it i'm always overworked but i also love this stuff and uh well one yeah. of the <clears throat> positive and i hate to say it this way but slight silver linings to covid is the normalcy of remote interviews. Now yes. they don't have to be in the same, we don't have to fly the crew yes. to, to LA or New York. And uh, the the Zoom interviews, are, I, I think, are they've definitely become a, a quite the norm and make it a lot easier to book anyone, right? Yeah, less excuses. Like, where are you? Well, oh, you can't like just put a laptop up in your, in your living, living room for 30 minutes? Um, yeah, I, I agree. Um, I definitely found booking... When COVID hit and quarantine hit, Comedy Central was kind enough to come to me and say, hey, let's do a, a, a quarantine talk show on Zoom almost immediately. And we launched that and that was called Stir Crazy. And now it's called the Untitled Josh Horowitz Show. And um, and yeah, it's not, again, we it's not like we can get everyone, everyone but like the the bar is um, high because we, because the accessibility is pretty easy at this point. Pretty flexible. Um, uh, that being said, I, I mean, I miss, I'm still, I'm doing more uh, in-person stuff. Um, I'm trying to find a right balance of like for special stuff to do it in person versus zoom. Um, so thankfully that's kind of starting to tip back to a, a balance. How often are you filming every week? Oh, uh, well, I mean, podcasts every week. Uh, I would say like there's at least two or three shoots a week for me. Um, again, between those five different gigs but you know some weeks there can be nothing some weeks there could be like six things um yeah and it's 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 less about the i mean it's less about the time of the actual shoot it's just about the prep and like all the stuff you have to watch like again you know people listening to this are like uh boo you have to watch a tv you show have to binge but, watch a show before it even comes out yeah but like i'm <laughs> but like i mean i like i'm doing sam jackson tomorrow and he has a six hour like apple thing and i like 
it's a career conversation. So not only do I like have to like dive into Sam Jackson's career, but I'm, I have to like watch his six hour series <laughs> and think about how I want to approach a conversation with a guy that's like a serious dude. So it's um, the, the, the hour of talking to the person is almost the, the least of it. It's, it's all the prep. The, the prep, uh, the prep with Samuel L. Jackson. I think I remember reading a fact once that he was a pallbearer. Martin Luther King, right? Martin Luther King's funeral. Yes. The, the, I mean, the, the ability to do any research on that man for the past 50 years. Yeah. No, is, he's like, a, he's like, a zealous, like, he's like sure. Forrest Gump. He's just been part of our, our collective history. Um, no, I'm psyched for it, though. I'm such a fan. And I, I, I've done him before, but um, he's uh, he's kind of, a, 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 again, one of those people that doesn't suffer fools. But I, 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 again, I like the challenge sometimes of uh, someone that's a little... Of winning them over. Yeah, yeah. Nothing's sure. better than winning a grumpy person over, for sure. Yeah, not saying he's grumpy, but he can be, he can be tough. He's not sure, going to... Sure, sure. you know, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, listen, I, I can't thank you enough. This was great. Um, Thanks, man. I, I got a super full fun hour. What's that? Super fun. Honestly, this was a, this was a, this really flew by. So thank you. I, it it yeah, drinks tend to make that uh, you know, make big time <laughs> fly. Like it's, it's an hour six and we haven't even gotten the last one. Keep Love the it. bottles, obviously. Use them. Learn, you know, drink them, uh, share them. You know, uh, the, these are meant to be shared with people and to have great conversations. And if there's anyone that I know that is good at having a conversation, it's Josh Horowitz. Thanks, so I, I can't thank you enough, buddy. Thanks. Anytime. Thanks for having me. Well, listen, we'll, uh, anything, where can people find you? Oh, uh, I mean the easiest place, you know, on all the social media, social medias, I'm Joshua Horowitz, uh, as you hear the New York sirens behind me. Um, yeah, yeah. That's the easiest place. I always put up all my like MTV news and comedy central and podcasts there. So, uh, yeah, check me out. Thanks. Cheers. Thanks buddy. Cheers to you.